You know, little, little did Landon know when he did that prologue that he would be having a baby, him and Brittany. So Brittany and Landon uh, are celebrating the birth of their son, uh, Niles Abraham Pickering. What a name, huh? Nice name. So we're very excited. That, that's actually my eighth grandson. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I don't know how many pap, great-grandchildren Papa has, but he'll be out here in the next service. I, we're going to have to celebrate together on, on that. Um, you know, uh, Landon did such a marvelous job, didn't he, in this uh, presentation of uh, men of faith. And uh, he did one on Mary, and then did one on Abraham. So today, uh, we're going to be breaking down... Uh, uh, the life of Solomon, and uh, it's going to be kind of a, an intriguing approach. Uh, it, it's probably going to be a twist to many of you, so uh, get ready for that. You might want to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, one thing I want to mention uh, before we, we jump into that, and that is that uh, I'm going to be doing a seminar on uh, marriage, it's, and it's not just for married people, singles who want to get ready for the the uh, greatest uh, challenging relationship on the face of the earth. Uh, And uh, so there'll be singles people, there'll be people who got a divorce and they're trying to figure out why things went wrong. And and that's uh, going to be on the 26th of June. Uh, There's a handout there on the the table, the uh, information uh, bar outside. Uh, In fact, um, um, there's a uh, former pro football player who's going to be there. I'm going to be interviewing him because... uh, uh, things have not gone well over the last 15 years in his marriage, and I uh, uh, started seeing him just a couple months ago, and there's been an amazing turnaround, and the turnaround has been so significant that uh, there's some possibilities that uh, he is going to be able to impact uh, people in ministry uh, through what he's gained and what he's learned. So I'm going to be interviewing him and his wife at this seminar. I'd love for uh, you to consider coming to it. It's not very uh, costly. It's only 45 bucks uh, per person. But if you have the books already, uh, that uh, drops to $30 per, per person if you already have the book. So um, but books will be available at, at the seminar. Well, we've got, a, we, we've got a lot to cover here, and uh, I'm going <laughs> to, last time I was on this stage, I went 52 minutes. I'm going to try not to do that this time, all right, and keep it within the, in the time frame that we have. So, has anybody here struggled with uh, the meaning and purpose of your life? Anybody? I think almost all of us have, and 3,000 years ago, Solomon struggled out loud his meaning and purpose in life. And uh, let me read to you a little bit about his struggle. Uh, He actually became uh, quite pessimistic about life, resentful, uh, disillusioned, and and you pick up hints of bitterness. But this is what he, he says in the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you've ever read the book. You need to read it. When I first read it, it kind of walloped me a bit. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, sun sets, and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes ever returning on its course. All streams flow in the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye can never, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is is filled of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It is here already long ago, and it is here before our time. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old. Even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. And then in chapter 2, verse 17 through 23, uh, he says, so I hated life. Because this work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless at chasing after wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun. 
because I must leave them to one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my efforts and skill under the sun. This is, too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This, too, is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This, too, is meaningless. Wow. That's in the Bible. But Solomon has, is struggling out loud his existence. And we are really fortunate that we are privy to his struggle, which we're going to unpack here as we proceed forward. But let me say a prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to come together to have this level of connectivity with each other and to come together in consecrated time or something very significant happens when we come together in the name of the most substantive life ever lived. And so, Father, bless us as we come together. May our time truly be substantive. May we gain immensely from this time that we have consecrated. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So, Solomon started out great. Do you know anyone who starts out great, but then it goes badly for them? I know of hundreds and hundreds of people who they started out great, but something happened to them along the course of life. So Solomon had this encounter with God. It was an incredible encounter with God. In Hebrew theology, it's called Bath Kol. Now, I think it still happens today. It's very, very rare, but it's like a voice speaks to you. It's happened to me only one time in my lifetime. Uh, but there was this definite speaking to Solomon. And God says, look, Solomon, ask anything that you want, and it will be given to you. And because Solomon's heart was so caught up with God at that point. And you know what Solomon asked for? I, I don't care about riches. <laughs> I don't care about popularity. I don't care about fame. I don't care about anything. He says, you know what I want, God? I want wisdom. Give me wisdom. And you know what? God honored that prayer. God gave him wisdom. And we see Solomon expediting this wisdom immediately uh, where he uh, has this court case with two prostitutes who are uh, uh, arguing over a, a child. Uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, he wrote the book of Proverbs. Do you know this, that every youth in ancient Israel, or beyond Solomon's era, but historically speaking, every youth memorized the entire book of Proverbs, the entire book of Proverbs, because it was that valuable of, uh, of a resource for them. Uh, he lectured on botany, on horticulture, on astronomy, uh, geopolitical affairs. People from all around the world came to listen to his wisdom. The Queen of Sheba came with a gift of $3.5 million dollars. And uh, uh, he, uh, man, he was, he was on his game. He built the temple. Uh, and then he built, uh, uh, he brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And it was a grand celebration. And you see Solomon, look, he's lifting up his hands in praise to God. He's using God's personal name, Yahweh. That's significant. He ushers in a golden age of prosperity. But Solomon gradually starts veering off course. Uh, this, is, this happens to free will beings east of Eden. Jesus mentioned this in Matthew 13, and I'll just kind of, for the sake of time, I'll just kind of paraphrase. He's talked about the, the seeds that planted in people's hearts, right? And one seed falls in shallow soil, but then the sun comes and boom, it, it, uh, the seed dies. Other seeds fall in the heart of, of, of uh, a person who uh, then gets anxious about life and gets caught up in the cares of life. And then that seed does not grow and, and become fruitful. Uh, 
Uh, he does talk about a seed that falls in, in, in good soil, a heart that's really truly open, and then that, that fruit produces 60, uh, 100 fold. Paul talked about a couple of fellas, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who made shipwreck of their faith. We're free will beings. We can choose to stay in a great connection with God or we can veer off course, which actually happened to Solomon. And I want to show you how that happened. So here's a, uh, yeah, this here. You know, I was born in the 20th century, not the 21st century. <laughs> when it comes to technology, that means a difference, right? Uh, so it looks like we're, is it going to work? Okay, if I can figure out how to get rid of all that. I'm used to using whiteboards, and how do I get rid of that? Okay, there I go. Okay, yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right, so here's how it happened. So you have uh, God, the creator. Right? And Solomon was caught up in God the Creator. But then he turned to a second reality. There's two realities the reality of the Creator and the reality of the creation. And so he makes a shift to the creation. And he starts, he stops connecting with the creator. Now there's various ways that he gets, and excuse my handwriting, I know it's third grade, but it's just the way it is. Um, he starts looking at, he starts going after pleasure. And the creation is very capable of delivering pleasure. Then he goes after materialism. He accumulates like no man has ever accumulate, accumulated in human history. He goes after achievement. He's quite the achiever. And, and he goes after intellectualism. Now, I'm going to break all these down with you here shortly, just a few minutes on each one of them. But you know what he also does? And it's not actually spelled out in Ecclesiastes, but it's in the historical narratives surrounding Ecclesiastes. Look, he goes after false religion. And all of this took Solomon away from a great connection with God. And you know what? These are the things that take many of God's people away from a connection with God. So um, what happens is the creation is not capable of delivering what a human being really needs. What happened is he tried to squeeze the creation for his sustenance. And he tried to derive meaning from the creation. And you know what he says? He said, it's meaningless. He says, it's meaningless. And he felt empty. You know how many times he used the word meaningless? 33 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, there's no point to life. It's utterly meaningless. Uh, and he felt quite empty. Now, I've been gathering a lot of quotes uh, over the years about people feeling this. Uh, in fact, uh, I happen to have written a book about this. <laughs> uh, I wrote a book on Ecclesiastes. Uh, I really have spent about three decades on this work. It was just published about three years ago. And uh, uh, I've been fascinated with the book Ecclesiastes uh, because uh, I think it really... Uh, uh, elicits something 
in the human soul for us to consider. But I, I, uh, I, I gathered a few quotes. I, I just want to, I, I find hundreds and hundreds of people talking about this meaningless thing, feeling empty. For instance, Deion Sanders. He says, uh, nothing was enough. When you are lying up with one woman, then you want two, then three. Let me get another car. That isn't it. Let me get another $2 million home. That isn't it. Another Rolex. That isn't it. Another woman. That isn't it. I was never happy. I was in, I was in pain, man. And uh, I, uh, there was an up-and-coming alternative music uh, guy and um, artist in San Diego he ended up committing suicide at age 19. Do you know what his last song was? He goes, I feel so empty. My life is a mess. My friends have all left me and I have nothing left. My body is broken, my mind is distressed. As I'm in misery, please lay me to rest. I don't know if you ever heard of Dean, Dean Jones, but he was the guy who did the Disney Love Bug uh, movies. You ever see any of those? You know, he said, he said I was making $52,000 a week. I had the fastest Ferrari, the big house on the hill overlooking the San Fernando Valley, and I was starring in motion pictures. But I was miserable, depressed, bitter, and angry. I had anything but peace and fulfillment. My life was a lot like a greyhound chasing a mechanical rabbit. I caught it only to realize I didn't, I didn't have anything but a mouthful of metal. And just one more, I could, I could give you dozens of these. You know, Lee Atwood was a, a great political leader in America. He was a young, up-and-coming political leader. And uh, he died at age 40 from a, a brain tumor. He said, I acquired more wealth, power, and prestige than most. But you can acquire all you want and still feel empty. He said, I had a tumor of the soul. I think this stuff is real for us. You take your eye off the creator, you're doomed. That's all I can say. And I've seen people fall like flies because they take their eye off of the creator. Now I want to do just very briefly I want to cover each one of these, and, but we're going to close the picture of this and kind of make a shift with this thing. Let's talk about pleasure for a minute. Solomon pursued pleasure like a kid with free reign in a candy store, and he got spiritually sick. He had 700 wives. Why would a man have 700 wives? I know he had political alliances. Sure, more than that. I think he was a sex addict. I really believe he was a sex addict. On top of that, he had 300 concubines. He, could, he had food, he had lavishes feasts, he, he, he said he drank, he said, I was a drinker, man. And he said, while I was drinking, he said, I tried to maintain wisdom while I was drinking. But he was a drinker, and uh, quite a drinker. Uh, he had entertainment every night. And you know who came up with the phrase, let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die? Solomon. 3,000 years ago, that's where that phrase come. Come on, let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Look, you know, God has wired us for pleasure. In Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 3, he, he talks about this. He said, uh, you know, I had pleasure for everything. And uh, he said, but it, 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 it didn't do anything for me. He said, I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. And in verse 10, he said, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. He was a hedonist. He became a hedonist. Now, you know, we're wired for pleasure. There's no doubt we're wired for pleasure. Look, our taste buds are wired for pleasure. 
Touch, we have touch receptors that create biochemistry, oxytocin, prolactin, well, that's more of a sedative, but anyhow, it, it produces marvelous biochemistry. Uh, in fact, what we call the six love molecules. There's six love molecules, you know that, that actually create a euphoria, an absolute euphoria when they come together, it's as powerful as cocaine. Um, but you know, this, this pleasure thing in a fallen world east of Eden has created a, a lot of trouble for us. Do you know that one of four Americans are addicted to something? One out of four, I'm not kidding you. Addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to food, addicted to gambling, addicted to spending. One out of four. Because you see, it's about pleasure. Now, let me show you, if I, because I don't want to erase that. I'm going to see, oh, where'd that thing go? Oh, there it is. All right. All right. Look at this. I'm going to show you why this happens. It is, you know, you were made to be an amped up human being. You were. We were made for the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, we were in utter euphoria in the Garden of Eden, perpetual euphoria. You were made to be an amped up being, that's right. And, and then see, but when we don't feel good, stressed out, lonely, sad, insignificant, unloved, when we don't feel good, we want to amp up. Because we know deep in our DNA, we are made to be an amped up human being. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. But what, what is our problem is we take the wrong turn. We turn hard left to amp up. We turn hard left to drugs, alcohol, food, pornography, sex, whatever it is. But what happens is this creates dysphoria and we're never able to sustain this amped up thing. It's only in turning hard right to God and getting high on life that we stay an amped up human being. And I can assure you, I am amped up every single day that I live on the face of this earth. There was a time when I struggled with, you know, being down and depressed, but those days are gone. They are gone, they're gone forever. Because when you get used to going hard right into thrilling relationship with God and getting high on life, you don't need this hard left nonsense because it will des destroy you. You know, I love what Joy Davidman said. She says she's the wife of C.S. Lewis. Uh, they've long since gone from the earth, but we'll get to meet him someday, right? She said, living for pleasure eventually makes life unpleasurable. Um, I had a guy, he spent, he spent $400 on a happy ending. Went to a massage parlor, spent $400 on a happy ending. I said, how'd you feel afterwards? He said, horrible. I said, what if you would have taken that $400 and fed a village? You think you would have felt better? We got options. The creation can give us all kinds of options for, for pleasure. Uh, but all sinful pleasure leads to meaningless and emptiness. We've got to be judicious about this uh, desire for pleasure. Um, gosh, there's so much to say about this. I'll just tell you one thing. You know, I, I, when, when I was a teenager, you know, I partied. I got drunk on weekends and I partied with everybody. But, you know, I became a, 17. I became a Christian. And uh, I remember sitting at home at night alone because I stopped going to the parties. I stopped the drinking. And there was a scripture that I remember Shaq, it was Jeremiah 15, 17 that I kept quoting every Friday night when everyone's out partying and do, says, because your hand was upon me, I sat alone. I did not go in the circle of the merrymakers or the partiers, nor did I exalt with them because thy hand was upon me. 
So we've got to resist the pleasure of the world, sinful pleasure of the world. But again, I'm going to bring this thing around full circle. All right, what about materialism? Solomon had, you know how many cars Solomon had? 1,400 cars. They were actually chariots. 1,400 cars, man, you know? And uh, they were all, made, most of those cars were made in, uh, in Egypt. Um, he had 12,000 horses. He had a palace. Do you know what his average income was? $25 million a year. When I uh, was looking at all that, I, you know, it reminded me of a little bit of Elvis Presley. My family and I, when we were, when my kids were younger, we went to Memphis to uh, visit Graceland. Uh, he, he built this mansion, which today wouldn't be much of a mansion today, you know, if you've ever seen it. But there was this ornate billiard room, uh, three televisions. Often when he got mad at the news, he would take a gun and he would blow out the TV. So there were TV guys bringing in new TVs all the time because if he didn't like it, he had a gun right by him. Boom, boom. Um, his, you know, all, when we, there was this display of things uh, at the Graceland. Uh, there was a nearby pavilion. You saw his purple and pink Cadillac uh, two Stutz Blackhawks. He had two personal uh, planes called Lisa Marie and Hound Dog 2. And one time when he was doing a concert in uh, Denver, he told his pilot, drive to Mem fly to Memphis, go pick up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich from this place. It's my favorite peanut butter sandwich. Did that and then flew back. That's a true story. You know, he gained enormous wealth with 18 number one hits, over a billion records, along with several movie royalties. And then, you know, he experienced this emptiness. He ends up August 16th, 1977, dying at age 42 from a heart attack, from his horrible way of life. Well, the materialism, you know, uh, you know, there was a documentary on uh, Michael Jackson and, uh, you know, he would go on $400,000 shopping sprees. They showed rooms that were filled with material possessions from the floor to the ceiling and have never been opened. Never been opened. Uh, and all the time, to feel good as a human being, he keeps going hard left, right? Uh, I remember when, uh, well, I remember when my sons would say, Dad, we, we like these sneakers. Or they cost like 140 something bucks when they were younger. We had a great basketball team, didn't we, brother? Back, you know, if you remember, we were a championship basketball team. They wanted those $140 sneakers. I said, you know, I told, I said, look, first of all, we can't afford that. But you got to memorize this scripture, boys, that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he has. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? You know what? The world doesn't believe that. They think that their life consists in the abundance of things they have. And then they come back empty, meaningless, empty. Um, I was sitting on my... I was sitting on my basketball court. We built a nice basketball court in the backyard because we're all basketball players. And I'm sitting there, I'm having my little, my morning devotional. And I'm, I'm sitting there and, uh, you know, it occurred to me, this basketball court has never thanked me. <laughs> Do you know that? It has never told me it loves me. The basketball court, it has its place. But the basketball court will never fill me. Never fill me. It can never do that. It is the spiritual things that fill us. It is the relational spiritual things that fill us. Now we got to be warned here because we live in the most prosperous nation ever in the history of the world. Ever. You know what? You all are stinking filthy rich. That's what you are. 
We are wealthy beyond belief, beyond belief. And we have got to get a handle on this thing because we are raising generations of kids who are entitled. I need that $800 iPhone, man. They feel entitled. And they haven't or need to learn the value of work. There's a lot about this material thing. I, I love what Rick Warren says. He says, the most valuable things in life are not things. We can't get faked out here. Now, let me talk just a moment about achievement. So Solomon was an achiever. You read about that in chapter two of Ecclesiastes four through nine. I'll just read a little bit of that. Um, he says, I, I, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself, planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water grows of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves. That's interesting. You know how to achieve? You know what he did? He conscripted 20,000 human beings and used them, conscripted forced labor. He used them to build his projects. I also own many more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces and so forth. He goes on. He, he talks about all his projects. Um, I, told, I told some parents the other day, I said, look, look you think your kids are going to become pro athletes? You really think they're going to become pro soccer, pro softball, pro that? You really think? You know what the you know what the per, the, the uh, percentage is that they'll ever become that is point zero zero seven. I think that's it. You could Google it, find it out. I don't know. I think it's close to that. It's very difficult to get that. But now, what are what are the parents doing here? Please listen to me. These parents I talk to, they don't have time for church on Sunday. They don't have time for the kingdom because their kids got, you know, uh, two games on Saturday and three games on Sunday. And, and boy, we got to help them become the, to achieve here athletically. Now, I'm for sports. I really am. But not before the kingdom of God. It's the world that comes first. For, men, for people. But for the kingdom of God people, that's us. You know what Matthew 6, 33 says? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. you. It would be good to memorize that scripture. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. You don't have to worry about a thing if you seek first the kingdom of God. Not seek sports or achievement first. Seek the kingdom of God first. Now, Gosh, there's so much to be said. I, I, I got to read to you just a, a couple little quotes here of observations by people about this whole thing. Look, look at this. Jim Carrey, you know what he says? He says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Martina Navratilova, the tennis pro, said this, the moment of victory is much too short to live for that and nothing else. Uh, Higgins says, when you go to the top, there's nothing there. And I like what Brad Pitt says here. He says, then you start um, to see the fickleness of celebrity that isn't rooted in something of real value. There is this strange wanting by people to get next to you. It has nothing to do with you, but it has something to do at, but with something they feel they are missing in themselves. Isn't that interesting? A lot more, uh, gosh, perspectives to ha have on this, but achievement has its place. Now, what is the place of achievement? Your growth in the human experience, you grow by achieving, by utilizing the best of yourself in this effort to achieve, you grow. Now, the big one is it's for serving. You achieve to serve. 
and bless other people. And then you bring glory to God through achieving. God's gift to you is your life. What you do with your life is your gift to him. Amen. It's like I bring you glory through achieving God, right? Now, so achievement has its place, but it will not fill your soul. You achieve to his, to his glory, you achieve with your soul. Now, what about knowledge, intellectualism? Um, wow. Man, we're intellectual beings. I don't know about you, I'm fascinated by, by knowledge. You know? uh, Ken Jennings with Jeopardy run $2.4 million. I remember watching Ken Jennings. I don't know, the world does he know that, you know? I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, TED Talks. You know what I do every morning? Every morning, every morning, I have a big glass of water get myself hydrated well. And you know what, I, I listened to Alistair Begg, one of the greatest preachers you could ever listen to. I have this app on my phone. Len is one who kind of tuned me into getting that app. And man, oh man, you talk about knowledge that pours out of Alistair Begg. I, 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 every single morning while I'm getting ready, I'm listening to a message by Alistair Begg. I had a, a guy, a, a, a surgeon that I was uh, had some time with and he, he explained to me how the suturing of veins, he explained a new technique that he developed in, because sometimes veins, the ends and they can't come together because they're, there's a, uh, they're damaged so badly. And he, he developed a method of suturing veins. It was so fascinating. We are intellectual beings. Solomon was brilliant. He called himself the Koalith, the teacher, the philosopher, the instructor. And as I said, people from all the, around the world came to hear him. But listen to this. You can get caught up in a trap and fill your brains, but not fill your soul. Getting a degree is a wonderful thing. Gaining knowledge is a wonderful thing. The Bible says that the, the, uh, that the wise person increases in knowledge and understanding. But if there's not the real spiritual purpose with that knowledge, which is to bless others, which is to serve others through your knowledge, it just, it just becomes empty. And Solomon said it's a chasing after the wind in chapter 1, verse 7. He had a lot to say about knowledge. Um, but I've found, you know, that people, and, and I guess, you know what I, I should do is that, that lay this out now, that in a connection with God, that if you have connection with God, guess what? You become appropriate with the creation. It's very important. Apart from a connection with God, you will be inappropriate with the creation on all of these fronts in a relationship with the creator, you will be appropriate with the creation. Uh, I've read a book uh, called Intellectuals by uh, uh, Johnson, who is a leading British historian. He's one of the top historians in the world. He studied intellectuals. Uh, you know, they, most of these intellectuals, they were messed up human beings. You know, Karl Marx? who was the founder of uh, Marxism, you know? He was a filthy human being. He never took a bath, shower. In fact, he had boils all over his body because he lived so unhygienically. No one liked him. He was an arrogant man. He was a liar. He, he fudged information and statistics and things like that. You need to read Paul Johnson about him. Because Karl Marx brought about the greatest evil ideology that the earth has ever seen in Marxism. They've murdered about 139 million people. And we're seeing an upsurge of Marxism now. I'm just saying that because here was an intellectual, apart from God, was utterly destructive upon human history. There's much more to say about that. But we don't have time.
Gosh, I'm running out of time. I'm down to like one minute. No, it says zero up there. <laughs> dang. <laughs> dang, dang, dang. That's all I can say. Um, I do want to say just one quick word about false religion. Is Solomon got caught up in false religion. When you disconnect with the true and living God, the creator, you think you can live without religion? No, we are religious beings. So we, 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 if we don't connect with the true and the living God, we go after religion in some crazy, crazy way. Like the Hellbot Comet people, they, they all commit suicide to get on a comet and you know, that's crazy. Uh, when I was in India, uh, speaking in India, I, I remember I uh, stopped and I walked in, a, uh, I wanted to observe what was going on in this Hindu parade. 750 million gods in Hinduism in a theology called pantheism. God is all, all in God, so everything's a God. The grotesque gods, it is unbelievable how grotesque these gods, I don't have time I, to, to share with you, but one thing Solomon did is he, he actually pumped up the pagan religions, Kamosh, Moloch, and Astaroth, where they offered infants on a bronze statue that was 45 degree angle, and they put the baby in the hands of this god, and the baby rolled down into a furnace and was burned alive. I guarantee some of Solomon's own children were sacrificed on those gods. He could have eradicated false religion, but he did not do that. Now, gosh, I got so much to say on that, but we're done. But let me complete the picture. As I said, appropriate with, the, with, with creation through wisdom and by enjoying the creation, those are two things that Solomon actually says. Now, there is closure with the creation. I've got to say this. Oh, there's closure with the creation. That comes through our death. But then we end in, up in eternity. Now, where did Solomon end up with all of this? He, you know, he did say that eternity has been set in the hearts of man. And he did say, uh, you know, here the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. It's more than interesting that Solomon's name is not found in the hallmark of faith in Hebrews 11 chapter. It is not there. There's a reason for that. He started strong. He disconnected with God. And then he was groveling at the end of his life. Groveling. In Ecclesiastes, he doesn't even mention the personal name of God. He did prior, but I guess he just couldn't feel that personal connection with God. Uh, boy, I, I, I'll just close with my short version. I had a long version, but I'm going to go with the short version here. Uh, there was the famous uh, Baptist preacher, Truett. And he was invited to have supper with one of the most wealthy Texans who actually lived in West Texas. And uh, after, after supper, they went upstairs and this wealthy man says, hey, you know, 25 years ago, I came to America penniless and look what I have. He said, over there are my wheat fields. And then over there are my oil, oil wells. And there, those are all my cattle. And through it, Paul's, he says, sir, you have that in that direction, that in direction, and you have that in that direction. Sir, what do you have in this direction? And that's really the question. What do we have in this direction? My encouragement to everyone here, you stay connected to God. Be appropriate with the creation. Stay connected to God, and what a life you're going to have. All right? God bless you. All right.